I'm Pokal Lainui, and what I want to do is take you for a ride in a helicopter, going up, 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 traveling over time as well as distance. And I remember a group, and I remember some of you, one of you especially, and that's Tom Kaufman. Back in 1968, and he probably remembers when we first met at the State <coughs> Constitutional Convention where loyal Hayden Burgess representing the YNI community as a delegate to the State Constitutional Convention. And what I want to do is just very briefly show some of my genealogy into the movement for Hawaiian sovereignty, being a proud American citizen, running for political office, getting elected at the age of, I think, 20 at that time, and then graduating from uh, university, going to law school, not able to complete, went over to George Washington University uh, in DC, cold, couldn't get a job, came back, joined the military, and then I started reading a book, and it was entitled Hawaii's <coughs> Story by Hawaii's Queen. And here I am wearing the uniform of the Air Force to go to war, ready to go to war in Vietnam, and the Queen is telling me, hey, dummy, this is what happened. <laughs> They took our nation, they overthrew our government. And as I was reading the story that she was writing, then I came to another story by Lawrence Fuchs, who writes the social history. What happened after Lilio Colony was overthrown and the Big Five came in, the takeover, and I was reading all of the names of the people who were in the 1968 convention. And a lot of the Republicans and the Big Five but times were changing. Hawaii became a so-called state in 1959. And then I started asking the question, and where do we go in the next chapter? What is the future of Hawaii? And then I said that there is no reason why we should continue in the same pattern of being Americans and merely mimicking the ways of the Americans. At that time, I took an oath that I would never salute the American flag and I had wanted to blow up buildings and destroy the system because I was so angry uh, before the, the term terrorist was invented. <laughs> I was an original terrorist. They court-martialed me because they caught me uh, refusing to obey a lawful command. I lied my way through the court-martial because if I was found guilty, I would never be able to go to law school. But I decided that what I would do is get into the system and explode the system from inside rather than staying on the outside. And so after I got out of the service, I was accepted at the University of Hawaii. And there I graduated in 1976. 1976, rolled about, and then I said I will never work for government or work for major corporations. I was going out to Waianae and practice my law and try to find ways of exploding the system from the inside. And there was where I met many others. Uh, Sylvia Reck is in here. My wife was very active. And we used to sit on the campuses of Ilani Palace and talk about the same stuff that we will be talking about today. What is the right to self-determination? Who are the people who have the right to self-determination? Who is a self? What happened historically? Where did it come from? How do we build uh, an analysis of how we move ourselves from a place of colonization, out of colonization, to decolonization? What are the stages? <laughs> is it merely getting rid of the the occupier and then we become decolonized? Or do we need to go through certain steps to wash ourselves from the mentality that they have brought in? We need to go through these steps. Step number one, recovery and rediscovery, where we find out really what the history was, not what they taught us in school. But let's go back into our history. And so we started writing about that history. Keone had written one book about the Hawaiian sovereignty. Uh, <clears throat> Tom brought and donated his book, Nation Within. It covers that recovery and rediscovery so that we can be very clear of that historical foundation. Out of that historical foundation, what happens? And many of you have seen what had happened. You get into the anger stage, the bitterness stage, 
the racist stage, the awfulizing stage. Oh, poor us Hawaiians, we got screwed. They're doing this, they're doing that, and all that stuff. And we grumble, we grumble, we grumble. We tell all you Hawaiians and all you Japs and all you Pakeis and everybody else go back home. Not fully appreciating that we are contradicting our own history. But it is because of that anger. So we get into that awfulizing stage. But that's part of the process of being traumatized so badly. And now we are trying to get into that third stage, the dreaming stage. Where do we go from here? Why do we want an independent nation? Why is it going to be any better than what we have right now? Is it merely to exchange who leads Hawaii? Or is it to change a whole shebang, change the values within the system, and really examine what is our deep culture? How do we operate with one another? Do we leave the DIE system, domination, individualism, and exclusion, and let that be the controlling mode of operating, whether it's in economics, in environment, in social relationship, in judiciary, and all of those things, or we, do we switch it? And if we switch it, where else do we go? What else do we have as a deep culture? Because that's all we've been grown up to be taught. And if we look more deeply and we look especially into our communities, instead of domination, it's always this concept of olu olu. Be relaxed. You can disagree, but you don't have to be angry with one another. Olu olu. Instead of individualism, it's always lokahi. There's a so second nature to us. Think of the group. Think of all of us, the family, lokahi. Instead of exclusion, because they're not part of us, exclusion. No, for our local community, it's aloha. Respectful inclusion. So instead of D-I-E on one side, we have O-L-A on the other side. We need to examine this kind of questions. How do we change the deep culture and in that way change the society itself so that we don't just simply take over and, and do the same thing that, we, that have been done against us. So when we talk about Hawaiian sovereignty, what is the objective? Is it so that native Hawaiians can be now the rulers and then continue with the domination over everybody else? And even if it means apartheid, then that's okay? It's not okay. We then lose value. So the most important thing, we got to examine the value. And that is what we need to do in the dreaming. And there's many other things we need to talk about in the dreaming. How do we survive economically? How do we survive militarily? What do we do with our environment? How can we change the environment now that we have no oversight by the Americans to tell us who we can trade with? What is our rules with regards to how we change the environment? We need to get settled on what the powers are. We need to start talking about the dreaming stage. If it's only, oh, we should be an independent nation, not enough. Too shallow. Everybody wants to be independent, of course. But why? Where do we go? We got to engage in the third stage of dreaming. Only after we've gone through that, then we build consensus. But that consensus can only come about when we incorporate as many voices as possible, hearing everybody else, get into arguments, disagreeing, disagreeing. We don't need to hate each other because we disagree, but it is only by that process can we build a strong foundation. And after we build in the consensus, then we can move to the execution of our plan of being an independent nation. Gotta talk about our stuff. What was that? Yeah, got to get going here on that. I will. <laughs> I had a discussion with this guy, Chief Mede, from Fiji. He says, you know, I was involved in the Rambuka overthrow, the revolution. And unfortunately, we never heard about these kind of theories of decolonization. We felt that as long as we can get a colonizer out, we take over, that was it. What happened after that? We were fighting among ourselves because there were really no consensus as to what direction we should go. So we were still playing the domination game. 
and you will find the same thing occurring in many other places that have been decolonized. We are talking about the development of a transitional society, a transitional authority, somebody that, or some group that can start transitioning us from where we're at now to bring about a new consciousness in the movement for self-determination. The kind of stuff that Leon is doing, we need to be aware of it, we need to support what is happening in the international arena. And yet, in the local arena, we cannot ignore that. We have to address the needs of our people here at home, especially the Hawaiian nationals. Who are the Hawaiian nationals? I'm one of them. And we have others in this room. How come I cannot vote for even the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, although I serve as trustee, because I refuse to say that I am a US citizen? How, can I, how come I cannot get jurors on our jury if they are Hawaiian nationals and they say, no, I'm sorry, the history tells me that I am not a U.S. citizen. Well, if that's the case, all you folks cannot sit on the jury. But who are the defendants? The guys who are promised, or the girls who are promised to have a jury of their peers. They're all excluded. We all excluded. We cannot get them on. So locally, we need to take action. We need to have the legislature change the law so that there will be no discrimination against Hawaiian nationals. Allow Hawaiian nationals to be fully incorporated into the society so that we can become full participants within the society. Yeah, we're going to get some difficulty about how we're going to work this out, how we're going to work that out, how much taxes you're going to pay. You mean you're only going to pay to the state government, but you're not going to pay to the federal government? Whatever it is, let's start working it out, but stop that marginalizing of the Hawaiian nationals by always, always pushing us to the margins so that we cannot really participate, we cannot have a voice in the political system here in Hawaii or in the economic system. We cannot get jobs because we've got to show that we are legitimately here in Hawaii or that we are U.S. citizens. So what do you do? I was executive director of the mental health clinic. I told my human resource person, never mind, sign up anybody. <laughs> but we need to get into the system and start making the change in the system from the inside until the laws change. So that's some of the work that needs to be done domestically. So domestically, we need to start working. Internationally, we need to start working. Right now, what we need is funds. And one of the purpose here is we've got to raise money. I listened to Leon, and I remember the days I had to travel to Geneva. What would I take with me? The first thing that I would pack up, dry sign in. Because I know once I hit Geneva, Switzerland, the place is so expensive, at least I can go out and look for vegetables and go buy a pot, and then I can eat. And then when I hear from him about not having enough money to catch a cab going from one point to the other point. So he's dragging his ukana along with him, looking for his hotel just to save money. And this old bugger having to do this in New York City, we got to support our emissaries. And, and that's just a small aspect of the sacrifices that he is now going through. And we need to start participating. Not only in, yeah, I support you folks, but the kind of support we need. So we need to, to support this organization. I call it the Hawaii National Transitional Authority. Is it incorporated in Hawaii? No. Do we have a membership? I refuse to make a membership list because I will not disclose to any government who our members are. You join because of your belief in the general theory of it, and you become a member if you want to be, become a member, and support in any way you want. But one of the things that we need to support is travel. We need to support in the work that we will do here locally. One of the questions that was asked, how can we be recognized if we are not a nation recognized by the United Nations? The United Nations have several other ways of recognition. One is called a liberation organization. You know, the PLO, 
and uh, the African Liberation Organization, they have special status within the United Nations. The Hawaii National Transitional Authority is itself a liberation organization and we need to, to be present there and say that we are seeking our liberation. And part of the work that we have already tried to do, uh, myself working back in the 1980s and Leon, who since the 80s have been constantly working there, have been trying to assert our liberation. And if we had more time, because I know Keone is rushing me, I'm going, I'm going to take up more time <laughs> and explain this part. A lot of people believe, and lawyers like us, we, we always say, well, you need to have the nation concede its sovereignty to the entity before the entity can decide on that nation and whether or not it is doing right or wrong within that nation. The International uh, Court of Justice was sent a question with this group of islands. It received its independence. The name is Mauritius. Yeah, Mauritius. Mauritius is a nation, 1965. It's a group of islands along the African coast, yeah? And Britain said, okay, we're gonna give you your independence, but we're gonna cut aside some of the islands, and we're gonna create a military base in this island called Chagos. But the island is called Chagos. The, the island is called, called Chagos. Yeah, yeah, and the military Garcia. base? Diego Garcia. Diego Garcia. So there's Mauritians, not Martians, Mauritians. <laughs> They go to the General Assembly of the United Nations and this is the question they ask. They are not suing Britain for failing to decolonize them. They are asking the General Assembly, did you folks meet your obligation, your sacred trust obligation to bring about decolonization because the United Nations gives to the General Assembly, to the United Nations, a sacred trust obligation to bring about decolonization. Did you folks succeed in 1965 when you declared that we're an independent nation? And we want the court to determine that question. What does the court say? The court says, okay, we can answer that question and answer that question for the General Assembly. England jumps in. The United States, who now are holding a base there, jumps in and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, you cannot do that. Because we refuse to concede jurisdiction. We refuse to concede our sovereignty to this question. And what did the court say? Oh, we're not addressing that question. We are answering the General Assembly on whether or not they have completed their obligation. And the decision just came out a few months ago. They said they never. How can you cut aside a uh, uh, group of islands and say, no, you have independence only on this group when the obligation is self-determination for non-self-governing people and territories? So they said, no, you got to give it back. You didn't need the consent of the United States who now operate in that military base. You didn't, didn't need the consent of Britain who cheated these folks. There are ways of doing many, many different things. And all those self-interest guides an individual country. But when the other countries are not necessarily self-interested and they willing to vote against the United States, which is what happened when, when uh, who was that, Kanaki, New Caledonia, and when uh, Tahiti, the Society Islands, they said, hey, the French tricked us. They cheated us. They said that we are part of France whether we like it or not. And who voted in that, that election? Everybody in Paris voted to see whether or not we stuck to France. It's wrong. The question went to the General Assembly, not to the Security Council, went to the General Assembly. Who controls the General Assembly today? All the countries that are now independent, three quarters of the United Nations, all independent since 1945. They all know what decolonization is about. You get all these African countries that have now become independent, all these Pacific Island countries all become independent, and in Asia all independent, and they teamed up and they all voted to put back Kanaki and uh, French Polynesia back on the list of places to be decolonized. Now people would normally say, no can, no can, never happen because you gotta fight against the United States or the United States and Britain. And they did, but they were outvoted. US, 
Britain, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. New Zealand. All the, these five always teaming up against the area that they have colonized. But this time the colonial governments or the former colonial governments came in and says, no, we're going to place them back. Hawaii is on the same place and we need to take advantage of that. So a lot of us believe that, oh, in 1959, we voted for statehood, we went to the United Nations, reported to the United Nations, the United Nations congratulated the United States and said now Hawaii is part of the United States. And what this paper says is that they cheated. And we show in detail, step by step, how they cheated. And we have communication from the, the State Department and all that stuff. It was a plan because they knew in 1960 the resolution with regards to decolonization was coming about. So they had to slip the United, the slip Hawaii and Alaska under the, the time limit, although they, they didn't follow the laws at that time. And so what we're saying is, hey, General Assembly, you didn't complete your responsibility. And either send it to the decolonization committee, the special committee on decolonization, or send it to the International Court of Justice, and let's review this question. So there are active things that are actually going on now in the international arena. The papers are available for you. Finally, the last one, which uh, even Leon and uh, Yoni has not seen, and that is somewhat related. And it is an evaluation of Hawaiian sovereignty, the history of the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. And we take a look at the most modern so-called attempt to resolve that issue. You folks remember the Na'i Aupuni Convention held in, uh, where is that, Waimanalo site? And so what this paper will do is do an analysis of that convention, compare it with the Native Hawaiian Convention. You remember when we went out and we said, okay, Hawaiian, you can vote for your own delegates. They will meet, they will make a proposal. And so we met, we were ready to make the proposal, and what happens, the state legislature and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs pull the rug from under us, refuse to finance us to conclusion, then come out with his na'i aupuni and say, oh, we're going to have a new convention to try to push you folks into federal recognition. And what has happened there? So it will give you some of the historical background, some of the principles by which we need to guide ourselves for uh, decolonization, and a step-by-step -step comparison with what came out at Na'iaupuni, that congregation, and what has been proposed at the uh, Navy Hawaiian Convention. Thank you. A lot of information, no? and we'll go to that's it.